Lord. Go ahead and take your Bibles and let's turn to the book of Job. The book of Job, Job chapter number 8, is where we will begin reading. And I have a, a bit of scripture that I'd like to read today. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll get it all read before time expires. Don't worry, it's not that much. All right, let's go ahead and stand to our feet, if you would please. Uh, Job chapter number 8, stretch your legs just a little bit. And I want to explain to you to make sure you're well aware of what's happening here in the text. Um, Job, Job has had a catastrophe in his life. And that catastrophe has resulted in the loss of the life of his children. His house is gone. His wealth is gone. His hopes have been shattered in those whom he loved the most are now so far away, either because of death or because of spite in his own wife. And now he's sitting there in agony and despair trying to figure out why this happened. And he insists that he hasn't done anything wrong. And some friends show up and sit down with him. And it's not too long before his friends begin to say, Well, Job, come on now. You know you've got some kind of hidden sin or something you've done inside that God is judging you for. And he persists that, no, that's not the case. No, that's, that's not the case. His friends seemingly become a bit impatient with him. And we'll begin to read one of the words of his friend, a man by the name of Bildad. And Bildad begins to speak in verse number 1 of Job chapter 8. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? In other words, how long are you going to keep persisting in this and, and not give in to the fact that maybe it was you that messed up? Bildad continues in verse number 3. Doth God pervert judgment, or doth the Almighty pervert justice? If thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgression... If thou wouldest seek unto God be times and make thy supplication to the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosper. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers." For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, but our days upon the earth are a shadow. Shall not they teach thee, and tell thee, and utter words out of thine heart? Can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? Whilst it is yet in his greenness, and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So are the paths of all that forget God." And the hypocrite's hope shall perish. He's calling Job a hypocrite here. Your hope shall perish. Verse 14. Whose hope shall be cut off? And whose trust shall be a spider's web just brushed away? He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. He is green before the sun, and his branch shooteth forth in his garden, his roots are wrapped about the heap, and seeth the place of stones. If he destroy him from his place, then it shall deny him, saying, I have not seen thee. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth shall, go, shall others grow. Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man. And he's thinking in his mind, and Job, you're being cast away. And neither will he help the evildoers till he fill thy mouth with laughing and thy lips with rejoicing. 
They that hate thee. And it's almost as if Bildad turns his face toward the Lord in the presence of Job and excludes Job from direct discourse, but allows Job to be in on Bildad's prayer. And here is Bildad's prayer towards God. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame. And the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. He's implying here, as he prays to God, that perhaps Job has hated God. He is implying here that Job perhaps has some wicked thing inside him. And because of that, he, Job, will come to naught. And he's praying and turning his face towards God in this. And then we see Job's answer in verse number 1 of chapter 9. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him... He cannot answer him. One of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? Which removeth the mountains and they know not. Which overturneth them in his anger. Which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble. Which commandeth the sun and it riseth not and sealeth up the stars which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the ways of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, which doth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without numbers, without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. How, who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou? God will not withdraw his anger. The proud helpers do stoop under him. Father, I pray that you would help me tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word and give us both understanding and and application of that truth. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage your people tonight who are in a place of calamity and a place of chaos. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Bildad was not the most comforting friend. Maybe you've got a friend kind of like the poor guy. If my name was Bildad, maybe I would be angry at everybody else with a better name too. But for whatever reason, Bildad was bent on this this perception, this this idea that Job's catastrophe was a result of Job's wickedness. Now, I would have to concede that sometimes our wickedness does bring catastrophe and sometimes our sin does bring judgment. However, knowing what we know about Job's life, we know that that is not the case here for Job. Now, was he a man, a sinful man, just like the rest of us? Yes, absolutely. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. We could sit down just as Job sat down. And and just as we could, so could Job rehearse in his mind and ours. Times where we didn't fulfill all that God wanted us to be. And we could remember times where where God wanted us to, to live a certain way. And we fell short. Just as Job could, so could we sit down in this agony. And admit to God that we are so small and so insignificant. And be overwhelmed by that thought. But we know that this was not the reason that catastrophe came to Job's life. In fact, for those who may not be as familiar with the story, if we were to go back, which we won't, but I would encourage you to read on your own, to the first two chapters of Job, you'll find that Job is a righteous man. He he fears the Lord and he departs or eschews evil. Uh, He is a man of integrity and he loves the Lord with, with all of his heart. He prays for his children. He makes sacrifice for them. And he walks humbly before the Lord. And it's only because of God's... uh 
could I say, compliment of Job uh, that he's in this whole predicament in the first place. Uh, for Satan comes before God and, and God turns to Satan and says, Hast thou considered my servant Job? In other words, God is complimenting Job in the presence of Satan. And now that's a big deal, church. Now I don't know that God's ever going to bring me up. Hey, as you considered my certain Jared? And Satan's going to say, yeah, what a disappointment to you, huh? <laughs> He's the accuser of the brethren. And the problem with Satan's accusation of me is that they're true. Thank the Lord for the blood of Jesus Christ. But Job... Job lived such a righteous life that even God turns to that accuser and says, what do you got to say about Job? And it's amazing, always been amazing to me, that Satan doesn't make one accusation about Job's character. <laughs> Not one. He'd have a list on me. And instead, he says, oh, it's because you're protecting him. And you know the rest of the story. God grants Satan permission to, to bring difficulty, pain, and agony into Job's life. And the truth is, despite how righteous we try to live, despite how godly we try to live, uh, despite how committed we are to God's Word, sometimes catastrophe comes. Sometimes difficulty shows up. Sometimes pain. Sometimes uh, we enter into the circumstances of life and we see that there is agony, there is vexation of spirit, there is depression, there is disappointment, and there is discouragement. And all of these things come, and it's not always because we are outside of the will of God. Sometimes, as is in the case with Job, it is because we are in the will of God that all of these things were poured out on him. And sometimes, because we are in the will of God, all of these things are poured out on us. For the Bible teaches so clearly that although we are supposed to live by faith, the just shall live by faith, that when we do all that lives if godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. They shall suffer it. They shall suffer it. So then comes the question, well, how then do we respond? And, and I would like to preach for the, for the moments I have remaining on this topic, coping with catastrophe. Coping with catastrophe. There's a lot that I could say about coping with catastrophe, and there's a lot the Bible has to say about this. So know that I'm not going to try to cover it all because I would be in every book of the Bible and every chapter of the Bible because the, book of the, Bi the books of the Bible are books that are written on the backdrops of catastrophe. Jeremiah and Lamentations are from the first verse until the last full of pain and agony. The book of Revelation is rife with catastrophe and problems. Even the, the life and ministry of Jesus Christ is overwhelmingly present by, by attack and, and enemies and evildoers which seek to take his life. And we see all of these things throughout the Bible. And there's a lot that we as believers should do in response to a world that is crumbling around us. But I am most interested in what Job says in verse number 3 and 4 of chapter 9. Job says concerning God, if he will contend with him, if, if a man contends with God, he cannot answer him. One of a thousand. And then he makes this statement in verse 4. He is wise in heart, speaking of God. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered? And I believe that one of the most, one of the worst things that we can do when catastrophe shows up is to allow our hearts to be hardened. And I would like to speak to that tonight from God's word. The effects of catastrophe on our heart can be many. 
Our heart can end up broken because of the attack of others or because of relationships that have gone awry. How many times have we had such great expectations of, of what's going to, to take place in, in our lives and have such wonderful relationships and, and the Lord brings friends into our lives that befriend us and encourage us and strengthen us and, and everything seems to be going so well only to find out later that that friend is betraying us and has stabbed us in the back and has walked away or moved away or, or in a worst case scenario has talked bad about us now behind our backs and yet is still so kind to us, to our face and our hearts in that catastrophe become so enraged and so angered and so quickly broken. Our hearts can be broken but hearts can also be hardened. Hardened. When catastrophe comes, our hearts can be so, so hardened because of that event that we become coarse and rude and mean and antagonistic. Our hearts can get to a place where after constant catastrophe without healing, that they don't desire to hear any words of counsel. They don't desire, nor do they feel any words of compassion. But our heart can become so hardened that it is set against the world and wants to conform the whole world out of anger and malice and frustration. When our hearts become hard, there are some indications of this hardness. And if by way of, of a little quiz here tonight, you might examine your own heart and see if any of these apply. Perhaps when catastrophe has come in, your heart has been hardened and you've noticed it because now sin doesn't bother you. Sin doesn't bother a hardened heart. In fact, I, I, I believe that sometimes when a heart becomes hardened, it, it throws itself and is consumed by sin. Saying, well, if I, if I can't be good enough and I can't have this wonderful, godly, righteous life, then I will give myself entirely to the other. And so many good people have I seen that were once faithful in the house of God and faithful with their family and faithful to train up their children. They would have a catastrophe of relationship, maybe a, a, a divorce comes into the home, or maybe a loss of job, or maybe a, a hurtful thing take place, even in the house of God, and their heart becomes so hardened that they begin to, to push away everything godly and give themselves entirely to the ways of the world. There's a man that I once was rather close to, he was a youth pastor, and had a wonderful family, and they, they seemed to be a family that lived so godly. Try to be separate from the things of the world, and giving themselves to the ministry of the gospel. Had several kids, and it seemed like they were just on fire for the Lord. And I don't know what it was that initially took place that that shifted and changed their course but I tell you there was an event that took place that rocked that family to its core it was a catastrophe And from that point, you could see the shift moving away and moving away. And instead of being fervent in prayer and fervent in their uh, service to the Lord, all of a sudden you started seeing other things crop up in their lives until they had entirely disappeared and resigned from the church and moved away. And, and I'll never forget the day that I walked into the Applebee's and I, I walked down the, the aisle that the waitress was leading me to and I went to sit down down at the table and I looked over to the bar and there was the husband and wife each with a glass of beer on the bar and I was thinking two years ago 
Two years ago, he'd be behind the pulpit preaching against it with tears in his eyes, talking about its dangers and, and talking about how we must remove ourselves from it and not even look upon it. And now he's lifting it to his own lips. What happened? His heart became hardened. And a hardened heart can sometimes get to a place where sin doesn't bother it. Instead, instead they throw their heart completely to it. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. I'll just give in to it, they say. Another indication of a hardened heart could be this. Not just that sin doesn't bother you, but righteousness doesn't motivate you. Righteousness doesn't motivate you. You could hear the greatest preaching ever to come off the lips of man. I mean, not tonight, but you know, some other time. You hear the greatest preaching ever to come off the lips of man. You hear the most moving testimony. You hear stories of lives being changed by the power of the gospel and souls being saved. And yet, you sit there with a hardened heart. And that righteousness, it just doesn't motivate you anymore. It doesn't move your heart. It doesn't convict your soul. It doesn't cause you to set your face towards Jesus and beg that, that you could be a part of the righteousness of God as well. A hardened heart is a heart in which sin doesn't bother you. Righteousness doesn't motivate you. And compassion no longer moves you. A hardened heart can become numb to everything except for the bitterness that caused that catastrophe. I have talked and counseled with others who it, they would describe themselves as completely numb to this world. Completely numb. I go to church, I just don't feel anything. I hear stories of loss all around me. I just don't feel anything. But when it comes to the cause of that, that breakup or the cause of that catastrophe, boy, there's rage there. But everywhere else, they've become numb. There's one other thing that I've noticed about a hardened heart is not only does sin not bother them, righteousness not motivate them, compassion not move them, but alternatives easily influence them. Why? Because they're looking for something to satisfy their soul. They're looking for some way to feel alive again and to get some kind of passion again. And they are easily influenced but never satisfied. And if these are things that you are experiencing in your life right now, please listen closely as we look to this text. And like a flag of warning, I would like to wave tonight if you're experiencing catastrophe in your life right now, whether it be because of something that's happening in the workplace, something that's happening in the home Something that's happening in the dark recesses of your heart and you just feel like, like life is slipping away. Then I beg you to consider what Job says here in verse number 4. That God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered. And to guard your heart. There are three truths about the hardened heart from Job chapter 9 verse 4 that I would like to point out. And this is the first one. A heart is hardened from within. It takes place from within. Uh, look at what Job says. He says that God is wise in heart and mighty in strength who hath hardened himself against him. You see, Job is saying that if your heart is hardened, it did not happen because of what happened on the outside. It happened on how you reacted to it on the inside. You know, maybe you've heard that statement, the same sun that, that melts the wax hardens the clay. What's the difference between that wax and between that clay? Well, it's what it's made of. What it's made of determines how it responds to that heat. That wax, 
the waxes that compose a candle, you light the top of that wick, and as that flame flickers, the wax closest to that flame, in the makeup of that wax, it can't handle that heat, it can't stay the same, and I'm sure that if you were to ask that wax, does it hurt? That wax would say, it hurts bad, it burns. What does that wax do? It melts down and begins to run down that candle until it finds a place that's cooler than the top, and it once again solidifies, but clay is different altogether. Clay, the dirty earth that we walk on, if you were to put it in an oven and turn up the heat, it decides it will not be moved. It's going to stay exactly like it is and nothing can change it. Clay, before it goes into that oven, is is malleable. It can be moved. It can be manipulated. But once in that oven, it's hardened and and no longer is it sensitive to to the forces that are working upon it. But make no mistake, according to what the Word of God teaches us in verse number four, that hardening, that hardening takes place not because of the heat that's on the outside, but because of the makeup of what is on the inside. And I will guarantee you that if your days are long on this earth, they'll be full of trouble and catastrophe will come and that heat will be turned up. And I simply want to ask you here tonight, what are you made of? What is it that that runs through your veins and makes up your heart? Because if it is the flesh then when the catastrophes of this life show up on the doorstep of your experience, your heart will be hardened. You'll you'll stiffen your neck. You'll respond with frustration and anger and bitterness and decide that you will not be moved. Yet God desires for us to be soft in His hand. You know, there are many things that can discourage a heart. Lots of things can infect that heart. Doubt can discourage that heart. I imagine Job not seeing God with his eyes, not knowing why all, why, why all this is happening. He seems to be full of doubt. He, in fact, when, when I read Job's response to Bildad, He's not making any definitive statements about his circumstance. He's just asking a whole bunch of questions. He says, I know it is of a truth, but how shall a man be just with God? Like, I don't, how can I be just with God? I, there's, there's doubt. There's uncertainty. What, uh, what's going on here? Uh, even this verse that we're reading, verse number four, is a question. God, he's wise in heart, mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered. There's questions. And see, whenever we're in the midst of trial and in the midst of adversity, doubt will almost always creep in. In fact, that's why it's so difficult to manage. What's going to happen? How is this going to end? You put your child in an ambulance and chase that ambulance down the road. What is it that is so fearful about uh, this situation? It's not knowing how it's going to end. That loss of job comes and you're fine for a couple months But then nothing seems to turn up and the bills keep coming in and food needs to keep coming to the table. And what is it that makes this so desperate? It's not knowing how it's all going to end up. And this is a place where the heart can so quickly be hardened. And instead of being molded by that circumstance in the hand of God, that doubt can harden the heart. Not only does doubt harden that heart, but from from within we allow our hearts to be hardened through difficulty. Difficulty, through difficulty, but all of those circumstances on the outside, all those circumstances on the outside just create a situation where we can blame something else for a hardened heart. The hardened heart comes from within. The second thing that I think we ought to learn from this text about the hardened heart and coping with catastrophe is not just that the heart is hardened from within, but is that once it's hardened, it is a heart that is hardened against God. 
against God. That's what Job says in verse number four. Who hath hardened himself against him, against God? Who hath hardened himself against God? And so many times we harden our hearts against other people and, and think that, oh, we're just hard and harsh toward them. Mark this down. You cannot be wrong with man and right with God. You can't do it. It's like trying to praise God with profanity. It doesn't work. It's like trying to, it's like trying to, to give to God out of sinful behavior. You cannot be wrong with man and right with God. And whenever you harden your heart, even if it's against another person, you need to understand that you are actually hardening your, hardening your heart against God. What does God want to do with your life? I think that's an important question to ask. What does God want to do with your life? And how does He plan on getting you from where you are to where God wants you to be. How does that happen? Does God buy you a ticket? Say, here, go down to Tyson McGee, get on an airplane. The ticket will explain itself. Is that how God gets us to where he wants us to be? No. Does he buy us a car? <laughs> Some of you are like, I wish. <laughs> Ferrari, please. <laughs> does he buy us a car? Does he give us a, a horse? How does he... <laughs> It's a funny thought. A donkey? How does God get us from where we are to where He would want us to be? I'll tell you how. By conforming us to the image of His Son. That's how He does it. You see, and that's why it's so important to know that God is not so much interested in what you do as He is interested in what you are. Because if you are the right thing, then you will do the right things. And you see, here in Christianity, we, we sometimes have that backwards. We, we try to clean up the outside without addressing the inside, where really uh, Jesus teaches most of the time uh, that it's a matter of the heart. It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Uh, the, the heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it's the inner man that we need to be most concerned about and if we are most concerned about the inner man then the outer man is going to take care of himself because it is just an outer working of what's on the inside right so so if that's the case then if you've hardened your heart on the inside even if it's just against some man then that means there's a part of your heart that God cannot move cannot conform because he does not force himself on man. But he gives man a choice to be conformed to his image or not. Now he will bring in catastrophe and he will use pain. And he will use the circumstances that not even God invited into your life that are so hurtful and so painful and so agonizing. And even though God didn't invite them into your lives, God will use those things. And when we harden our hearts because of catastrophe, we are not just hardening them against some man, some woman, some employer, some political candidate. Really what we're doing is we're hardening our hearts against God. The last thing that I want to, to point out. When we're coping with catastrophe, let's guard our hearts because they are hardened not from outside, but they are hardened from within. Let's be so cautious because when we harden our hearts out of anger or bitterness, 
We don't harden them just against other people, the people that we're so angry against and so unforgiving towards, but we harden them against God. But, but lastly, I, I would like to point out that when we harden our hearts, hardening our hearts, it, it, it doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't fix the problem. Look at what Job says, the very end of verse number four. Who hath hardened himself against him, against God, and hath prospered. Like name somebody, is what he's saying. Do you know of anyone who's hardened his heart against God and has prospered? Do you know of anyone who has decided to be, to be unforgiving and, and bitter and it's helped them. You know, I have, I have once heard, and I like repeating this, that, that bitterness, bitterness is the poison that we drink wishing we could give it to our enemies. Oh, we get this, this poisonous concoction of, of an attack of words. And uh, recently, you know, I made mention how, boy, we, we really get our zingers ready uh, after we get back to the house and we get all our thoughts together and we, you know, we say all the words that we wish we would have said in that argument right to the mirror and it fosters that, that bitterness and we can't wait until we can tangle with that foe again and because of that broken relationship or that hurt or that pain that was caused and we're hardening our hearts now deciding we're not looking for forgiveness we're not looking for restoration. We're not trying to reconcile with this person. Instead, we just want vengeance. We want to rob what rightfully belongs to God. And we want to take it upon ourselves. And in that vengeful attitude, we actually think it's going to make things better. And we've lied to ourselves. And when we do that, you may feel a little better for a moment, but really all it's doing is it's taking that hardening process a little bit farther. And it's giving it teeth, and it's giving it, to wor giving it words. And see, this is a desperate condition. Desperate condition. To harden our hearts against Him. Because it's not going to fix anything. In fact, it's going to make everything worse. Now, I don't like, I don't like bringing this guy up very often. My dad always says, you don't have to bring up trouble. Trouble comes up on its own. But you know, Satan is just as real as God is. And Satan is not as powerful, but he's just as real. Satan's just as real as, as you and I are. And you realize that the Bible says in Ezekiel concerning the spiritual giftedness of Satan, are you aware that it says that he is, if I remember the, the, the phrase, I can't, perfect, full of wisdom, the Bible says. Full of wisdom in Ezekiel. You know, wisdom is, I've used this definition before, and I, my goal is to beat it into your brains until you get this. But wisdom is knowing what to do right now in order to get the best result later. Someone who's wise with their money, they save it now to have the best result later. Someone who's not wise with their money spends it all now, and they don't give one thought about what to do later. And the Bible says that Satan is full of wisdom. In other words, he's reached the capacity of wisdom. You can't add any more. It's full. If you were to try any more to pour any more wisdom into Satan, you couldn't do it. Glass is full. In other words, Satan knows exactly what to do right now in order to bring his best result later. Now could I bring your attention back to the whole reason that Job has written? To pull the curtain back on some of the work of Satan here in the first two chapters to show that God is always faithful, to show that God always cares for His people. But you learn something here. You see this struggle, even though Satan is not mentioned in this particular chapter, chapter number 9, Satan is trying to get Job. That's Satan's entire purpose. 
He's trying to attack his heart. He's not trying to give him a heart attack. He's trying to give him a hardened heart. Because if you mess with the heart, then you can mess with everything else. And if Satan knows, if he's full of wisdom and he knows what to do right now to get his best result later, then doesn't it make sense that he would aim for the heart? And by the way, he doesn't fight fair. And he will use any relationship, he will use any circumstance, he will use any catastrophe, uh, he will use even good things and, and cause a hardened heart to view them with, with paranoia, skepticism. Well, why were they so nice to me today? Are they trying to get to me? I mean, he will mess with us as best he can and he will try to harden our hearts to where we can't even feel the compassion of those around us, uh, where we feel like everybody's against us. Well, guess what? Everybody's not against you. In fact, there's a lot of people that love you and there's a God in heaven that will never forsake you. And even though these friends around Job are trying to say that you need to come to terms with the fact that God is bringing judgment on you, Job had enough sense not to harden his heart against God and not to look towards the heaven and shake his fist. But instead, he did quite the opposite. He softened his heart. He said, Lord, you're bigger than I am. I can't understand all the things that you are. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why these things are happening. I don't know why I hurt so bad. I don't know why my family is buried while wicked families are still living just fine. Job says, I don't know why I went from the mountaintop down to the valley. I don't know why he won't just let me roll over into the grave. But I know this, that you're bigger than all of these things, God. And I know that if I allow my heart to be hardened, I'm not going to be able to prosper either. And he can Kept his heart soft and sensitive, even when surrounded by criticism, even when baptized in the fire of catastrophe. And I think we ought to strengthen our faith in the Lord, regardless of what comes. Because God's going to use it all to conform us to the image of His Son.